This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and healthful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344. Or visit our website at www.vsh.org. vsh.org. Aloha, and welcome to the monthly public presentation of the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii. Since 1990, the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii has been following our mission of promoting human health, animal rights, and protection of the environment by means of vegetarian education as we've grown to become one of the largest all-volunteer, nonprofit vegetarian societies in the nation. So if you're not yet a member, and if even if you're not get a vegetarian, we'd like to welcome you to join the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii tonight. There are a lot of benefits. We have a large number of restaurants that are both vegan or veg friendly that will give membership discounts as well as natural foods groceries such as down to earth organic and natural stores discounts on three islands, Maui, Oahu, and Kauai. We also have a very informative newsletter for you that's published quarterly either electronically in full color, or you can get it by mail in black and white. We also have wonderful social activities for you, such as vegan dine outs that we have every month with our guest of honor, our speaker for that month. How many of you have been to one of our dine outs? For example, last month, Dr. Bill Harris was our speaker and we had a wonderful dine out for him on September 19 over at Castle Medical Center's The Bistro. It was an all vegan buffet featuring all kinds of great things such as a tricolor uh, roasted sweet potato with candied pecans dish and it was just really really good. Uh, it had fresh greens from their uh, Castle Medical Center's garden. It was only ten dollars a person. We hope the next time we have a dine out you'll join us for that. And also, Dr. Harris had a free lecture right afterwards, so we just walked right over to the Wellness Auditorium. We had 65 people there, and it was pretty amazing. And I'd like to thank, if any of them are here or will you know, know about this later, uh, Eileen Tawata, Nicole Kerr, the director of the Wellness Center there, Mele Fernandez, and Ruby Hayasaka, who created all those great foods for us from the Castle Medical Center for making those two events so enjoyable for all of us involved. I'd like to also remind you that our biggest event of the year is coming up. Our annual all-vegan pre-Thanksgiving dinner buffet arranged for us by UH Professor Emeritus Carl Seff. He's the guy who puts it together for us every year and we really appreciate it. 15 years. We already have a really good sized group. For the past couple of years it's been 300. So I hope you plan to come and join us that day with your friends and family. So please see the flyers on the free literature table for more information or go to uh, vsh.org slash Thanksgiving to see the menu and to make your reservations now. I'm just going to briefly mention that we did have a Gandhi's birthday table last week at, in Waikiki and want to thank Gandhi International Institute for Peace. We also were able to highlight World Day for Farmed Animals that was also on the same day as Gandhi's birthday at, at that table. We shared it with Meg Turner who's sitting there at the down to earth table in the back as well as Mama T and um, lots of good food was served. So if you'd like to join this great group of volunteers while having fun and making a positive contribution to the world, please see me before you go tonight. We'd also like to invite you to stay after tonight's talk to enjoy samples of vegan dishes donated by the generosity of Down to Earth. We're recording tonight's presentation for broadcast on the VSH TV series Vegetarian, which appears on public access channels across the state, including on Oahu's Olelo Channel 55, on Wednesday mornings at 11 o'clock, and on some Thursdays at 6 p.m. You can also view videos of this and many of our past presentations on our website, vsh.org, where you'll find many other resources, including our famous dining guide, which again, Dr. Seth, person that we have to thank for for this. It's now time to introduce our special guest. We're delighted to welcome Leslie Ashburn. 
Chef Leslie Ashburn was born in Washington State, but she didn't stay there. She grew up in Idaho and has lived in Alaska, California, Hawaii, and Japan, where she lived for three years and got her training in macrobiotics. She is also a world traveler whose second language is Spanish. She has a Bachelor of Science degree in psychology from the University of Oregon. In 1998, Leslie came to Hawaii to attend the University of Hawaii, where she received a Master's of Arts degree in English as a second language. Leslie, who has been a complete vegetarian since 2004 and before then, and on and off again vegan since 1987. She is an internationally trained chef who brings an ease and expertise for creating cosmopolitan vegan macrobiotic food, changing stereotypes about what it means to eat healthy. She works with a wide variety of respected community members, including preparing life-changing meals for seminars with the local living treasure, Dr. Terry Shintani. She is a co-founder of and serves on the board of directors for the Hawaii Food Policy Council. She co-authored a chapter in Diet for a Small Island, which is in press, called Democratic Food Education, Colonialism, Culture, and the Task of the Cooking Class. She is also a published author in Biomed and Cognitive Psychology. In what little spare time she has, Leslie enjoys running, yoga, art, languages, and gardening. Leslie's presentation tonight is entitled Compassionate Activism. Please join me in welcoming Leslie Ashburn. So good evening, everybody. Welcome, and thank you so very much for taking time to come tonight and hear my talk. I really want to thank the Vegetarian Society and all the board of directors, any of the volunteers, and anybody who took part in making this happen tonight. Usually I'm cooking, so I'm showing up in a different capacity as a speaker. So this should be very entertaining for me, and hopefully for you. So the topic is compassionate activism. And I would love to dedicate this talk tonight to two people who are a great inspiration to me. The first is Harriet Tubman. She was a slave in the 1800s. And while she was a slave, she worked on the Underground Railroad to free other slaves and then finally became free herself. She was a woman with very little resources. She had no money. She actually had some severe illness, so she was physically debilitated. She had so much vision and so much courage, and so I've been reading about her lately, and she's a huge inspiration to me. The other person to dedicate it to for being such an amazing person to speak out and share you know, his vision for the United States and ultimately be killed because of speaking up Martin Luther King. And in case you guys didn't know, his son, Martin Luther King Jr., is somebody who advocates a vegan diet as a natural extension of Martin Luther King's philosophy. They actively practice veganism in their work still today. So you may have heard some of these ideas before. I'm going to show you this book. It's called Neither Man Nor Beast. This is written by Carol Adams. So if you ever have a chance to pick up work by Carol Adams, I highly recommend reading her work. So if you want to come take a look after the talk, I'd be happy to show you. It's available at the library. So before I get started, I want to give you a little bit more context. So yes, I was born in Washington. In 1981, when I was 11, my parents moved my family to northern Idaho. Here is what Idaho is known for. Number one, lumber. So there's a huge logging industry, and then paper. So you guys might have heard of Hagedone, the Hagedone company. He's actually from northern Idaho. Mining, so Idaho is the gem state. 
they found every kind of gem available in Idaho. So it's very rich in natural resources. Farming, lentils, potatoes, of course, in southern Idaho. Wheat is one of the other main crops that grow there. Chemicals, so in particular fertilizer and electronics. Tourism is a huge industry there. Here's another thing that Idaho is known for and is a big reason for why I want to talk about this topic because it's really the filter that helped me see the world in a different way and changed the way I looked at food and changed the way I saw the world. So in 1981, I was in seventh grade. By 1984 to about 1986, we have Richard Butler there. And Richard Butler, he was somebody who founded Aryan Nations. That was five minutes from my family's home. And they were very active in the community, let's just say. There was very, very little diversity in Idaho when I lived there. So for anybody, not just people of color, anybody in that community who was different was bullied and put down. So if you had a skateboard, if you were an artist, if you wore different clothes, if you were gay or lesbian, or fill in the blank. Um, and that really bothered me a lot. It was an uncomfortable place to live for that reason. In 1987, I graduated and went to the University of Idaho, which was an oasis. Suddenly, I was in a whole new place. It was still northern Idaho, but actually there was diversity and community and an amazing co-op and people who, you know, were cooperating with each other. And it was like, I end up in this class called the literature of horror. So at that time, my dual major was psychology and English. And so I was 21 or 22, and I show up, you know, early in the morning, and I'm looking at this guy, my teacher, Michael Delahoyd. And he's, I had no idea what to expect, but suddenly he's teaching our class about how when Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein, Frankenstein's monster was vegetarian. And I was like, what's he talking about? <laughs> and he went on to say that the harpies in the, the Greek literature were also vegan. And I was blown away. He's the first person who introduced Carol Adams to me and talked about her, one of her first books, which is called The Sexual Politics of Meat. So a lot of this, again, is inspired by having a brilliant teacher who spoke out in a very conservative place and certainly changed my life. So I hope that somehow my talk will change the way you look at something or inspire you to bring more of a vegan diet and lifestyle into your life. So my main goals are to think systematically about how the way we treat animals is interconnected to how we treat others. And I mean animals, women, children, people of color, nature, and any other kind of marginalized, disadvantaged group. I want to examine how oppression has been maintained and perpetuated in these interconnected groups. So it's not isolated, right? And then propose solutions. So there are a couple of things that are presupposed for my talk today. So I want to start with those. Um, the first is that social categories in our world reflect the dominant culture or the ruling class. So if you have two people and they're meeting up for some purpose, one person speaks English and French and the other person speaks English, what, what language are they going to speak together? Of course they're going to speak English, right? Here's another example, maybe you've had this happen to you before. You go out with your friends and you go to a restaurant and you look at the menu and you go, oh, another spaghetti pasta dish. Great. <laughs> that your only vegan option, <laughs> right? So 
Everywhere we go, we see reflections of the dominant culture. Social categories reflect power differentials. So the ones that are important, especially for today, are gender, male and female, race, white and non-white, and species, human and non-human. So from the dominant culture, the ideology is really one of power and control, right? So one has more power than the other. So a dual way of thinking or seeing the world. So the other part of that ideology is androcentrism. So the practice, conscious or otherwise, of placing male human beings or the masculine point of view at the center of one's view of the world and its culture and history. So where do we see this? We see it in education, literature, religion, language, TV and film, the arts, politics, law, and science, right? So pretty much everywhere. Flesh and bodies in this ideology are a commodity for sale. So eating meat, right? Eating, let's just change meat right now to dead animal bodies. Animals that were once living. Dead animal flesh has been culturally constructed as something that's edible, right? So here's this trucker hat. I can't say it's from Idaho, but it might have been. <laughs> I didn't climb to the top of the food chain to be a vegetarian. So how does this cultural construction happen? The corollary is vegetables and other non-meat foods are viewed as women's food. <coughs> so vegetables are equated with passivity. For example, being brain damaged. You're a fruit, a sissy, or a girl if you don't eat meat. So I'm going to show you a video in a minute, a popular television show that shows this idea. Hey, you know, especially men, did you know that eating tofu feminizes you? Okay, there's no evidence of that. But here's this idea, real people eat meat. So do you have a picture in your mind of what a real person looks like? What is somebody who, if you don't eat meat, you're not a real person? Who does that person look like? So the, the real people, I think, are the, you know, in this context. So we have the person who's objectified, the other, right? Or the people who are marginalized, the republic of outsiders. Essentially, this means the children, the animals, the women, the people of color, nature, right? Anybody who's outside the framework of the dominant culture. So here's some images that help illustrate this idea. So this is Esquire. Eat like a man. <laughs> the only cookbook a man will ever need. A big, fat, juicy cheeseburger in a land of tofu. And I'm telling you, tofu takes a whooping. <laughs> That's in particular. They have something against tofu. It's not even just meat, right? You've got your big manly SUV. Originally, this video was called Restore Your Manhood. It's a commercial for Hummer. And they got in so much trouble for this that they had to change their wording. But just remember, the original version is Restore Your Manhood. So the idea, right, is that this man is questioning his masculinity because he's feeling all weird seeing this other guy who's got piles and piles of meat, right? So in order to restore his manliness, he has to go get a Hummer, right? Carrots also really take a beating for some reason. Okay, so here's another video I'm going to show you. This is from Seinfeld. This is the idea, going back to the thing I mentioned earlier, that you might, you know, be kind of girly or something like that if you don't eat meat. I can't believe Elaine's never taken you here before. Well, I'm really not much of a meat eater. You don't eat meat? What are you, one of those? Well, no, I'm not one of those. <laughs> when we were little girls, Grandma Memma would take us to a matinee and then dinner here. Grandma Memma? Elaine must have mentioned Grandma Memma. No, I think I would have remembered Memma. Oh, well, that's typical. 
Elaine never liked Grandma Memo. Ready? I'll have the porterhouse medium rare, baked potato with sour cream. What do you recommend besides a steak? The lamb chops are good. Anything lighter? How do you prepare the chicken? It's a full bird, stuffed with ham, topped with gorgonzola. <laughs> you know what? I think I'll just have a salad. Thank you. Just a salad. Just a salad. Just a salad. <laughs> He doesn't eat meat, but he's embarrassed, you know, to say that he doesn't eat meat, so he's trying to hide it from her. And uh, look how people respond, you know, like, oh, are you one of those? Oh, you know. Okay, so I want to show you a different idea of what manliness looks like. So have you guys heard of this vegan firefighter? So uh, I'm not sure how you say his name, Corey Kalanick maybe, but he's a vegan firefighter. So he became famous for this act that you're going to see. He feels about the world, right? That's his ideology that you value all life. To me, what a man. <laughs> okay, so here's something else that you may have encountered, right? So you're with somebody and you're, of course you're probably at the dinner table, you're probably eating a meal because this is when it always comes up, right? They're noticing that you have a different diet and they go, oh, well, if plants can be eaten, why not animals, right? And if not animals, why plants? So this is more of the cultural construction that's happening. Um, vegetarians and anyone else outside the dominant culture are marginalized, demonized, mocked, and ignored. Have you guys ever felt like that? Okay. Not for 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Bill said not for 20 years. So here's what people do, right? But vegetables have feelings too, right? Stop the horror. Eat meat, you broccoli killer. Plants have feelings too. Eat meat. Vegans are evil. Eat meat. I have emotional feelings. Oh. Don't be mean to greens. Potatoes. Every day, thousands of innocent plants are killed by vegetarians. Help end the violence. Somebody shared it with me on Facebook, and I thought, oh, I can't wait to, <laughs> to use this in my talk. But plants can be exploited. So right now, we've got a lot of monocropping. We have GMOs. We have pesticides and fertilizers. But guess what? Those are for the meat industry. Plants are actually a process of life. 
So if you're going to harvest a grain or a bean or a nut or a seed, you do not have to kill the plant in order to eat that food. So it's a process of life, not a process of death. Uh, so one of the main things that's happening is what Carol Adams in her books calls the absent referent. And this is really a key point for the talk. So this is what happens. This is how we take animals and culturally construct it into something that you can actually eat as food. It's the invisibility or absence of the original referent. Behind every meal of quote unquote meat is an absence and a disappearance. This is the absence and disappearance of the life and the reality of the violent death of the animal. It's a place where you have this sort of free-floating image of something that's meat. So we hear a lot of lies, right? So how does this happen? In advertising, we see this fantasy versus a reality. So meat and dairy come from the pastoral farm. So the red barn is just iconic, right? So we think, oh, what a happy life those animals have. But the reality is that we're talking about corporate capitalism. If you've seen Food Inc., you might recognize this particular image. So we've got the company man with his briefcase and his suit heading off to the factory. Very different than the idea of the farm that they want us to believe. Uh, so just another image, right? If you think about your, uh, I don't want to pick on any one food, but for some reason when I see this, I think of Cheese Whiz. This is where our food comes from in America. It comes from this mechanized, industrialized place. Uh, this is a picture of a farm, a factory farm for cows. Right, really different, just gonna go back. Got the pigs, right, not a very happy life. There's a lot of literature over here that I encourage you to pick up. It's very gruesome. <laughs> Any idea what would be in this truck? While you're thinking about it, I was driving down Piikoi Avenue after teaching a cookie class. So I'm taking this picture from inside my car and I pulled up next to it and I was like, ooh, food grade, I wonder what that means. <laughs> wonder what's inside. That's right. Milk, that's how your milk is delivered. The USDA is also responsible for a lot of this idea. Meat, dairy, and eggs are good for you. And just in case you didn't know, <laughs> the USDA does not endorse Meatless Monday. Somebody did some kind of guerrilla thing on their website, I guess, and so <laughs> there's a statement on their website that said they endorse Meatless Monday, but they just wanted everyone to know that no, in fact, they do not. So here's some more of the, the advertisements. Um, that people have received. If red meat can fuel evolution, it can fuel a couple of hungry kids. This idea spun by our government. Meat, dairy, eggs, all these things are good for you. Meat, it's in the meal for health defense. The one thing that stands out is every day, right? And look at this, the image of the perfect family here. And the daughter looks exactly like the mother. That's kind of weird. So here's another one. Nourishing meat, a complete protein. Why do we say complete? This is what it says in the text here. Because the protein of meat contains all the essential amino acids essential to growth and well-being. That's why meat is being served much more oftener. Much more oftener. <laughs> Apparently it doesn't, eating meat does not make you have good grammar. <laughs> two to three times a day, two. And oh yes, and very young children too. So yes, you're right in liking meat. And isn't the eating good? American Meat Institute. The reality. Research has very conclusively shown that animal foods are linked to many serious lifestyle-related illnesses, including various forms of cancer, diabetes, osteoporosis, heart disease, stroke. I mean, we could just rattle off, right? Hypertension. <laughs> what else? So if you're interested in reading more about this, I encourage you to go to the Physicians Committee of Responsible Medicine's website, pcrm.org. They have the best site, I think, for what the current research is on how healthy a vegan diet is for us, and in contrast, how unhealthy animal-based diet is.
So let me just throw in, because we're talking about this idea that eating meat makes you, you know, so manly. <laughs> um, the other reality is that it does the opposite. It gives you erectile dysfunction. <laughs> so we just have to throw that out there. Okay, how else does this happen? Through language. So language breaks the associations between dead bodies and flesh. The quote-unquote ADOS tenderizers that make gruesomeness palatable are mass nouns. So beef, meal, pork, chicken, meat. Right? There, there's no animal there. So this is what I mean, that the absent referent, you take away the life of the animal, the you know, quote unquote personhood or individuality of the animal and replace it with this sort of free floating concept. Um, we also have words like automation, factory farming, food producing unit, protein harvester, computerized unit, factory environment, egg producing machine, bio machine, crop. Someone kills animals so that I can eat their corpses for meat. Animals are killed to be eaten as meat. Animals are meat. Meat animals. And then finally, meat. Right, so something people do to animals, again, is switched around to become animals' nature. So here's an example. We have a chicken. So you can see the full life of the animal. Hopefully this chicken is having a good life. Okay, versus the mass noun, chicken. So there's no individuality, no distinctiveness, no uniqueness. This is only body parts. What body part are we having there? The breast. Right, this is important, right? Okay, so all the associations are removed. A unique being is made into a consumable thing. It has no face, no identity. So that these changes happen in language makes it easier to culturally construct the idea that eating flesh is acceptable. Okay, why does this happen to keep dead animal flesh separated from any idea that he or she was once an animal and had a sentient life? To hide the violence. So this is another important thing to put a flag by. So any literal and figurative process where an animal disappears in name or body is the absent referent. We don't eat animals. We eat meat. If animals are alive, we don't eat them. Everybody knows this, right? So one of the most important things that happened to me when I learned this was to look at what was there as an animal to see the life of the animal, to see the person. Hey, there's a dead bird in this bucket of dead chicken parts. I'm suing. <laughs> so suddenly there's a referent, right? Suddenly this person realized like, oh my God, that's a dead bird. Has anyone ever walked through Chinatown in the, where they have the kind of open air markets? Just as an aside, something else I do, I'm a teacher, so I have a background as Lorraine mentioned in language. So I like to combine that with food education. So I took a group of Danes and Swedes down through Chinatown and they were horrified. And of course, because you see the live, you see the animal, you see the life of the animal and you have a sense of what kind of suffering maybe that the animal has experienced, it's gruesome. So they said, don't they have any like standards? <laughs> for these animals, like, this is really violent. And like, yeah, standards, um, they're all being killed for food. <laughs> I don't know if anybody switched to being vegan, but they seriously considered it after experiencing the life of the animal. So here's another thing that they tell us, like, yoo-hoo, animals want to be eaten. So sorry, Charlie, <laughs> right? He's so happy he just swims right into that can for us. Yay! <laughs> Right, this, this pig wants to be sausage, right? So this says something to the effect of this like makes your food taste better and yeah, 
so much better. So these hogs are, yeah, they're just hanging out on the barbecue, drinking beers, <laughs> having a good time. This one I love because the animals are lining up to go into the grinder. So thank goodness for Dan Perraro and his Bizarro <laughs> cartoons, <laughs> bringing balance back to the world. So please answer true or false. If I were a chicken, I would gladly suffer and die to become a nugget. <laughs> so the true violence of the flesh and body industry is invisible. So the slaughterhouse specifically is highly secretive and hidden. Other interlocking forms of oppression are similarly invisible under the ideology of the dom dominant culture. So we can see how these intersect. When we see how animals are treated, we see how others in the world are treated. So here's some parallels with women, flesh, and body parts. So the overlapping absent referent prevents us from seeing the connections. We live in a body and flesh advocating culture. Flesh is a commodity for sale. So part of making a cow into meat, one, is rendering it non-male. We don't have a cow anymore. First, we just have parts, the flank, the rib, the chuck, the sirloin. So that's the name, the language part first, how it changes. So this is from an actual restaurant. What do you suppose is on this menu? It says, like your chicks hot. Chicken, not women. So I was talking about, you take that, the actual animal, a chicken, and turn it into a part, like a breast, right, or meat. So here's what's happening in advertising with women's bodies. There's no person here. It's just a part. They take animals and make them feminine. And take women and make them like animals. If you're okay with killing an animal, you're gonna be okay with other forms of oppression like hurting or oppressing women in some way. So there's a lot of examples. So what's for sale here? That's a woman's bottom. Boneless hip sirloin. $6.99 per pound. Um, this is Ludacris, the singer. Again, there's no person here. It's just a body part. He likes his tasty wings. So, legs. Legs, butt. Here we have thighs. This one to me is really disturbing. So, essentially, that looks like the same part. In one case, it's cooked. Right, in one case it's not. So this is why I became vegan. <laughs> because how many women out there have ever felt objectified? It happens all the time. I'm just so uncomfortable with that that I had to look, you know, at the bigger picture. This is Arby's. This is a fairly new ad. We're about to reveal something you're really gonna drool over. So they're sexualizing meat. So here, this is also from Food Inc. So we've got the, what is it, 1950? Growing, they're farming this chicken. And in 2008, so this is also from Food Inc., which is why it has this date on there. So they're feeding the animal artificial things to make it grow faster. And in particular, to have bigger breasts. So there is an obsession, right, with, with bigger breasts. So real fries in a fake world. Succulent racks attract record crowds to Ribfest. Turkey hooker, easy pickup from pan to platter. This one is also very interesting. So you, this is chicken on the left, right? And again, so chicken wants to be eaten. It has this very, you know, sexy pose, like come get me. And it's almost the exact same pose. That's a restaurant for seafood with an Asian woman sitting on the middle of the table. Who is the food? So animals can be worked, sold, killed, and consumed. Yes, we're, we're riding them. But any fool can see we're riding them for their own good. <laughs> and we're guiding them toward, progressive, toward the progressive policies they need. Um, here's tofu again. So we've got bacon, who's so much fun and flexible. 
and Monsieur Tofu, right? So the poor Frenchman. <laughs> Only one can remain at the top of the food chain again. So just think critically about the world. Think about how you see other people and where you're situated in the, the system. So who does the dominant culture employ in the production of flesh? Um, the most oppressed people by race, class, and sex. So in the flesh packing industry, about 54,000 non-unionized meat packing workers. They're minorities. Many undocumented migrants with no rights. Many are women. 95% African-American women in the poultry industry. Um, it's mindless heavy labor, it's stressful, and it's dangerous. So it's the second highest rate of personal injury of any occupation in the United States. It's filthy working conditions. Uh, turnover rate from 60 to 100% depending on the industry. Workers are disposable commodities like the dead animals. African-American women are scraping the insides of 5,000 chickens' lungs. Uh, they're called lung gunners. 25% in the poultry industry suffer injuries. So their health, these women's health, is seriously compromised. They also have no control over e earning a living, no control over their work lives. The assembly line workers become inert, unthinking, unfeeling objects. So it's easy to replace a migrant who's illegal. They're not really people. They're just like a unit on the assembly line. Eating a dead chicken. So this is where you have to think about what you're eating and be mindful. Eating a dead chicken in a fast food restaurant means that both the animal and women have suffered for you to be eating it. The last parallel is with the environment. So the production and consumption of animal flesh has serious environmental consequences. Deforestation water consumption, soil erosion, unrecyclable excrement, pollution, energy demands like fossil fuels and raw materials. So with water, a vegan diet is 300 gallons of water. A vegetarian diet takes 1,200 gallons of water. A flesh diet takes 4,200 gallons of water. With energy, 500 calories of food energy from one pound of steak takes 20,000 calories of fossil fuels. Corn is used in the production of flesh. And when you go to the grocery store, the true cost is not figured into what it really is. We pay our tax money to the government. The government subsidizes these industries. The true cost for a pound of hamburger is $35 a pound. The true cost of beef steak is $89 per pound. So we have millions of acres of deforested land. Animals and their habitats are killed when the land is deforested. Overuse means the soil has desertification. We have really serious erosion, so we're losing the topsoil. We have the greenhouse effect, monocropping, pesticides and fertilizers. The alternative, one vegan meal, you saved about 3,000 gallons of water. You saved about 16 pounds of grain. You saved your money and your health. You helped the planet. Thank you. So racism, sexism, class exploitation, and ecological destruction are interlocking pillars upon which the structure of patriarchy rests. So I said I was going to end with solutions. So to avoid a cruel act against nature these days is impossible. Right? We all drove here, so we committed a cruel act against nature. But how can we avoid exploitation as much as possible? So I think this really involves reflection. Where do I benefit? from the dominant culture? Where am I situated within the interrelated system? Do I impose my dietary decisions on other racial or ethnic groups? How do I feel about animals, children, the poor, women, people of color, non-dominant men, the environment? Do all members of our society have the option to be vegetarian or vegan? Whose knowledge are we talking about? How do I decide how I should personally act toward fill in the blank? Right? 
What have I learned about animals, children, the poor, women, people of color, non-dominant men, the environment? How are the issues of feeling and knowing resolved when I've learned about this? So I just recommend that you query yourself. People ask me all the time, don't you ever cheat? You know, what's your cheat food? Or how do you stay motivated? And these are the things that keep me motivated because this is my value system, right? I don't want to violate my value system. I will feel that about myself as a person. And I also identify with the suffering of women and the people of color I knew and anybody else who had been marginalized in my community growing up. When you're out there, as much as possible, try to restore that absent referent. So begin to see what has intentionally been made invisible. Find the contradictions in your own life. Get rid of duality and hierarchies from your life. Don't be imperialist, racist, sexist, classist, ageist, specious, or any other ist. Most important too, choose a diet that supports life. So plants, eat plants that are grown close to the source. So eat whole foods. And when possible, get your food when it's organic, grown with sustainable methods. So that's how we can start to minimize, minimize the exploitation. So thank you. I don't, hopefully we have time for questions. She asked, how did I solve my dilemma with quinoa? It's a double-edged sword because it's also helping them earn a living. So I haven't resolved it yet. She asked, why is palm oil genocidal? Because of the deforestation that's happening. It kills the animals. They're not using sustainable methods. And they're also not valuing the communities where they're growing it. How do I feel health-wise? It's a saturated fat. so. You know, we're not really supposed to eat as much of that. Definitely in a health supportive diet, minimizing oil as much as possible is good. So olive oil, coconut oil, you know, there's other options. Bake your own cookies. Thank you so much again, everybody. Appreciate your being here. Thank you very much, Leslie Ashburn, for this very thoughtful and illuminating talk. For all the rest of you, I would really like to invite you oh, to join us over at the kitchen for some delicious vegan refreshments donated by the generosity of Down to Earth. Thank you all for coming. And I appreciate that you're already putting away the chairs. You're very well trained. <laughs> OK, good night, everyone. Mahalo for coming. Have a safe return home. Bye. This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and helpful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344. Or visit our website at www.vsh.org. vsh.org.